you very much. All right. <coughs> good, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to be here. This is actually my first ever trip to Africa. I'm very happy to make it happen in here. And I want to, of course, uh, give my personal thanks to uh, my longtime friend, Eric Moulin, Achilles, and others, and for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, very interesting event. Um, also, you know, uh, I do want to commend that uh, 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 Michaelis, you gave uh, one of the maybe the best uh, tutorial and lecture on LMs I've ever heard, uh, which uh, literally uh, left uh, very little to be said in addition to this topic. So I was uh, asked to prepare also a lecture for LLMs, uh, but uh, I kind of knew that uh, Michaelis uh, is going to pretty much uh, cover everything needs to be covered. So I took the liberty and uh, slightly twist the topic a little bit uh, to maybe say just a few words in addition on LMs and then discuss uh, what's coming forward. So it will be a relatively higher level talk, uh, not so technical as uh, Michaelis just did. And uh, if uh, you, know, you, know, you have uh, questions or you are interested in the technical details, I'm available you know, uh, today, tomorrow. We can take it offline for in-depth discussion. Uh, both Michaelis and uh, Eric mentioned about uh, my new role as the president of the Mohammed bin Zayed University of AI. If you bear with me, I will spend uh, three minutes to briefly introduce the university to you in case that uh, you want to visit or want to continue your uh, graduate and want study or postdocs or maybe doing a faculty job in our university. So this university was uh, created about four years ago, and uh, it is currently focusing only on graduate education and the basic research, and uh, it is in Abu Dhabi. And uh, in the past uh, three years, uh, we've undergone really a very fast-paced progress. We started from uh, you know, only uh, uh, one department, machine learning, and now we are having seven departments, machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, computer science, robotics, HCI statistics. And also we are going to be adding uh, a few new colleges, the School of uh, Public Health, the School of uh, Decision Science, which will be added in the next few years. And uh, this is the trajectory of the growth of our faculty, uh, students, and also researchers. And uh, we, we've been keeping the bar quite high. So many, if not most, of the faculty were selected you know, from uh, top schools around the world. And uh, these are just a snapshot about the, you know, some of the star faculties we are having. And uh, you see uh, uh, Eric Moulin already was featured here. And uh, Michaelis will be showing up in our next version of the cover page. And, uh, and uh, the university has done you know, uh, their job you know, in a very cost-effective way. So on a per faculty, per capita uh, basis, if you measure the publication and citation, we rank very high worldwide. And the average age index right now is close to 50, which is also close to uh, Harding Mellon, where I also serve as a professor. And our students are coming all over the world Right now, more than 30 nationalities were represented. So it's mo by far the most diverse university I ever served, more diverse than Carnegie Mellon, than UC Berkeley. And, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we are you know, uh, welcoming you know, uh, students, applicants from all over the world to apply and to join us. And uh, you can see some logos which represents the current pool of applicants. They come from uh, you know, uh, top schools around the world. And uh, just to sum up, yes, right now we ranked at uh, 18th on CS ranking in the departments that uh, you know we operate. You know, uh, you know, we are not, uh, of course, a big school, so we don't cover all the discipline yet in computer science and in science. But uh, for the ones AI, machine learning, CD, and NLP, which were funded already, you know, uh, we cumulatively reached 18th. 
and uh, we are also working with uh, uh, leading universities worldwide, MIT, Berkeley, Cal Cal Technique, Carnegie Mellon, and so on, uh, with uh, many joint research projects. And now leading our way into the space of uh, LM, you know, Mohammed Bin Zayed University of AI is uh, one of the few universities in the world uh, which has the capacity and the infrastructure to be a player, you know, in pre-training and all phases of large language models. Because uh, we, before we actually, in fact, before this wave was coming, the university leadership has kept in mind already to be jumping ahead and uh, accumulate infrastructures and also, you know, uh, uh, manpower to kind of uh, be ready for this wave. So, you know, uh, these are the key projects you know, some of which actually involves uh, the development of uh, LM itself, but also applications, you know, in biology, in uh, sustainability, and uh, uh, information science, and uh, so on. So uh, that's where, you know, the university uh, kind of uh, distinguishes itself from uh, many other schools in terms of uh, uh, becoming a active player and a, uh, a trend leader, you know, uh, in knowledge AI research. Now, let me uh, say a few words about uh, our work in uh, the large language model. So last year, we took the initiative to form, uh, I believe again, the first uh, institute of foundation models worldwide. And uh, in this institute, we kind of uh, uh, built a zoo of uh, foundation models, not only in large language, but also you know, in genomics. And also, I'm going to say a few words about the future of uh, LMs, which is word models and action models. And uh, so now driving into the main thing of uh, this uh, winter school. So there is uh, now a, a worldwide attention and enthusiasm to study foundation models and large language models. And uh, Michaelis gave a, a very exhaustive and detailed tutorial about how you know uh, that was designed and what's the science behind it. So here I want to just uh, uh, share with you some of our own experience in the life cycle of uh, producing and uh, playing with the foundation models so that you know you get a taste about uh, uh, you know how you know different uh, uh, organizations and different researchers can pivot into this business based on your interest and also uh, your resource so let me introduce the animals that I want to say a few words about first right Jays and the Vicuna and the LLM 360 Jace, as uh, Michaelis and uh, uh, Eric just mentioned, uh, is now the most powerful Arabic language model uh, pre-trained you know, uh, by any organization. Uh, it was actually an initiative uh, taken by you know, uh, you know, UAE you know, to really uh, position itself to be you know, a leading player, not only in AI, but also in using AI to serve the community. Therefore, you know, uh, we do a lot of uh, 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 kind of a detailed uh, caretaking uh, around this model. Because if you use, for example, you know, a uh, general purpose large language model, say, you know, the ChatGPT or other models trained in different countries, uh, some of sometimes, you know, the cultural nuance, you know, the, 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 the regional know-how and so forth are missing. And these are important to engage with uh, a unique population or a population with unique needs. So in that regard, you know, Jace uh, uh, is uh, filling the gap. And uh, so far, it is uh, the best performer you know, uh, in LM performance in the Arabic language model. But also, Jace is not only doing Arab. It's also a bilingual model uh, trained with uh, both English and uh, Arabic. So uh, even on the English performance, it is on par with a open source llama model of the same size. And I'm going to skip these slides. You already heard about the life cycle, the, the production workflow of uh, a large language model. So Jace is pretty much following the same uh, kind of uh, protocol. Uh, but I think uh, uh, if you are interested in, you know, uh, the, the kind of the safety mechanisms behind, you know, a uh, specialized large language model, you want to read a paper and find out how we, you know, uh, put particular attention on fine tuning and uh, prompting and uh, safeguarding 
you know, uh, this particular model in, you know, a uh, very intricate local context. The next model I want to say a few words is uh, the Lacuna model. Okay, Jace was a pre-trained model, you know, uh, made from scratch based on very large data set and also a huge computer infrastructure. By the way, the computer infrastructure I didn't mention was not even a GPU infrastructure. It's called the, the Galaxy Condor machine from uh, Cerberus, which has a uh, much bigger library uh, in memory and also, you know, a high bandwidth communications between the cores. So it's uh, requiring some uh, uh, special programming, you know, to adapt uh, the Python code and the existing library into a uh, more specialized and high performant hardware infrastructure. But um, not many people and many, you know, organizations can afford really pre-training large language model from scratch. And then fine tuning, as Mr. Lee just mentioned, become uh, a very popular and the necessary skill and, uh, you know, a, uh, you know a, a, a practice. So Lacuna is uh, coming out of uh, this vein of research. It is uh, based on Lama, but it is also making use of a very high quality, you know, uh, conversational data between real human and uh, ChatGPT. And uh, it was uh, really, uh, you know, trained with uh, a very tight, small budget because that was uh, really coming out of uh, a group from my former students with, uh, at that time, very little computing resources. But it managed to really uh, get to the very top, you know, of uh, the leaderboard in terms of, uh, you know, the language performance. And uh, that actually was maybe uh, one of the major uh, propeller of uh, now the mushrooming, you know, a widespread exercise of uh, fine tuning models with all specialized data by all, you know, different institutions. You know, leading Google to start worry about, you know, the leadership position or the moat those big companies can build, you know, uh, with their large language models pre-trained. And again, there is, uh, in principle, not too much secret sauce. What you need, you know, is a good pre-trained model and also very, very high quality, you know, uh, additional fine-tuned data. And then you put them into a pipeline. The maybe uh, important technique nuance in, you know, uh, working with the Lacuna is uh, how we can serve a model. I'm not sure how many of you have really uh, worried about this business. If you really have a very popular large language model, training them is one business but allowing, say, a few million people or maybe even larger population to have a frequent access and a good user experience on a daily basis is also very difficult because uh, your queries can come in the order of uh, you know, billions per day, right? So that requires you to also have a very good distributed infrastructure and everything for inference, not just for training. And uh, in Lacuna, there are some uh, very nice ideas, you know, uh, invented to make that happen. So the life cycle of a LM training, um, you know, is actually a uh, very, very complicated one. So here I, you know, I'm trying to uh, summarize uh, what we have experienced in producing our own pre-trained and fine-tuned and uh, high capacity serving large language models. And we found ourselves to be in a space of uh, uh, behaving beyond like a research scientist uh, or even an engineer. We need to worry about uh, many, many pragmatic issues, you know, uh, in, you know, you know, uh, in a production environment, including even, you know, how much budget to ask for and also, you know, how you uh, design the interface of the model. Uh, you know, this may sound not very relevant, you know, to a, uh, you know, academic scholar, uh, but I imagine now, you know, the gap between the academic community and uh, the, the, the industry, the public, especially in the space of AI, is, uh, is really blurring. Uh, maybe some of you are interested in bringing this technology into, you know, uh, a startup, you know, or translate them into other applications. And these are the issues you want to worry about. So where to get this uh, piece of knowledge? So that's something, you know, uh, leading to our next project. For example, you know, uh, you are told by your, your planning your boss, you know, to now reproduce the app, right? So that's kind of a, uh, appear to be a very straightforward uh, undertaking. You have the data already published by Lama. You have also the model, 
you know, also make open source over their, their you know, code base and the libraries from uh, a package. And then the paper also published some algorithms in the previous paper. But we actually did that. Okay, in fact, nobody, very few people had the, the resource or the interest to really, you know, uh, reproduce it. But uh, as an academic organization, wanting to understand really how to reproduce others' results, so we did take the effort to reproduce a few 7 billion parameter models following prescribed strategies. And we found that there is a non-trivial performance gap between a trivial reproduction from the one being published. Okay, so there must be something, you know, that is uh, not explicitly described, you know, in any published report. For example, you know, here are some of the problems that we run into, right? How do you actually process your data to the more kind of a fine level of details? For example, you know, uh, what's uh, the mixing ratio between different type of data? Uh, what is the curriculum? Which data set you put first? Which you put next? And uh, how to filter and clean, you know, to certain peculiar data types? So these are actually not described uh, thoroughly in any publications. Then optimizations, again, you know, the high level, you can hear that uh, it is a, a gating message, but uh, very often time, you know, the precision, you know, uh, that you need to use, you know, to, uh, to encode uh, the gradings may not uh, be explicit. And then what if you run into a, uh, an end loss? Uh, what if uh, you have uh, this uh, very, very annoying uh, loss spikes in your training? It is uh, not, uh, you know, often discussed at detail how to even handle that because uh, uh, it's probably not even rewarding to describe that because no people or very few people will ever reproduce such larger models in the academic community anyway. It's expensive. And the companies uh, who can afford to reproduce that, they don't care to publish it, right? So that, that's kind of a, a, you know, a, a gap in the middle. And then, you know, there are issues about uh, the infrastructure, how do you parallelize the model and uh, how do you resolve problems? So. In you know uh, our uh, you know experience of uh, building our own pre-trained long performance models, including the J's, we actually you know uh, you know worked out many of these nuances in a very painful fashion, and we actually want to make this uh, knowledge available to the community so that uh, if you know other players in the academia or in startup who are not very well funded. You know, they don't have to go through a very expensive, uh, you know, exploration process. And that is the project of LLM360. So what is uh, LLM360? Yeah, it is uh, a, uh, you know, a project that tries to and advocates to open source, but open source with a quote of everything that uh, we experienced with uh, the large language model, pre-training and fine-tuning and prompting and other, you know, deployment issues. Why I say open source with a quote? Well, uh, nowadays, you know, open source becomes uh, a, 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 a norm, you know, uh, that many, many uh, developers uh, are, you know, advocating, are practicing. Uh, for example, we have heard that uh, in Mecca, pretty much open source uh, everything they, 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 they produce, as we saw from uh, the table that, you know, Hades just showed, right? But if you dive into the details, Again, the open source does not necessarily mean full transparency. For example, the open source usually translates to they will publish the weights already being learned you know, from the model. They can publish the data, the processed one you know, that you are going to use, and maybe you know, uh, some of the uh, performance and tests and, uh, you know, and uh, fine tuning data that is available. But uh, as I just mentioned, when you really, really want to reproduce you know, or to produce your own, large language model from scratch, you need to worry about many other things, right? You know, uh, uh, such as, you know, um, you know, as I mentioned, the data weighting, you know, how to deal with the bugs and so forth. So here, our project open source, not only the weights, but also the raw data, processed and unprocessed, and also the code, the actual kind of a program and a code that you use to run the training training and testing and evaluation, and also the checkpoints that you use to plot these uh, weight and bias plots. You know, you can checkpoint 
you know, less often and more often, the more often the better because you can spot, you know, any issues such as a spike, you know, NAN and then do something. So we actually also document those uh, checkpoints and then want to publish that. So altogether, for every model that we train, we collect 360 checkpoints so that, uh, you know, people could uh, take on this data and reproduce both the success and the failure of uh, pre-training and fine-tuning large language model at any step during its life cycle. And also study maybe hopefully the theoretical insight behind it, such as when, you know, uh, the scaling law, you know, uh, needs to, you know, uh, be taken into consideration to size up the data, you know, or to stop adding data. And when emergent properties can happen during which epoch of your training, right? Why sometimes you'll see a bad curve in the first uh, 90% of the training, but all of a sudden, you know, uh, in the last 10%, you'll see a big jump, you know, of the performance of LMUs and so forth. Uh, so these are the problems. I don't have an answer, but I actually would love to invite the community, you know, to together study that. But without uh, such a high degree of open source, it is very hard for the academic community to even play a role in such an exciting study. So, so far, uh, we put uh, the, the 360 uh, checkpoints and the trace of uh, three models you know, online. One is uh, called the, you know, the, the Amber model, which uh, is our trivial reproduction of uh, the, uh, the Lama 7B, which isn't very performant, but hopefully people can study the trace and study why that's not performant. Then we took some lesson and uh, produced uh, the crystal, which is a high performant you know, 7B large language model doing both uh, uh, you know, uh, language function, but also coding functions. And actually it's now performing at best you know, uh, in both dimension compared to code llama and also the standard llama. And then there is one bigger model, hopefully to be uh, launched you know, uh, in a matter of uh, two or three weeks, which is our own production of the 65 billion, you know, llama-sized large language model, also pre-trained, which took us half a year, you know, to, uh, to really finish the training. I think that's, uh, again, you know, a, a, a gold mine, you know, of a lot of insights and also, you know, uh, informations in terms of the behavior of uh, training large language models of this magnitude. I don't think, uh, you know, uh, too many people are yet having any insight about what's going on when you are producing such large language model, except if you are a member of the Meta or OpenAI or Gemini. Right? Okay, with that, uh, I'm uh, done with uh, showing off some of the uh, recent, uh, you know, uh, progress and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, results. I'm going to complement what uh, Michaelis just said and dive into some issues you know, uh, in the algorithmic system for large language models. Right? So how do you actually train such animals? In addition to learning, you know, all the foundational techniques, algorithms, and model architectures. Well, these are basic what's behind the model. I just want to have one quick page, one page summary about what has been said already, right? You know, it's built on very complicated self and the cross attention mechanisms you need to have a transformer-like architecture to put all these uh, attention mechanisms together into layers. And uh, nowadays, uh, in dealing with uh, the image and other type of uh, generative task, the diffusion process has also been introduced into the Gen AI you know, uh, landscape. And uh, the training is based on a autoregressive loss and also it's self-supervised by you know, mask and the prediction. And then the algorithm behind them is really a gradient-based algorithm, right? And then there are these so-called uh, large collection of hacks, right? Such as the fine-tuning, for example, uh, you know, train, uh, uh, chain of thoughts, uh, REG, and many of them, which is to augment a already trained large language model to make them either smarter, you know, or you know, uh, be uh, aligned better with uh, human preferences in the form of fairness, trustworthiness, and so forth, right? So I don't think I need to say anything more about uh, what the LM can do. You know, many people see already uh, quite amazing experiences uh, of uh, QA and chat experience with that. But uh, it's important to also realize that uh, there are many things that a large language model cannot do, 
effect. I think one of the major, you know, cannot lies on the very, uh, how should I say, you know, debatable, you know, and the highly debated uh, notion about whether large language model understood what it's generating, and also can they understand more, you know, uh, uh, type of information that will be integrated into large language model, such as, you know, multimodal data fusion and so forth. I would say that there are a lot of uh, things to happen maybe ahead of us. I, I was uh, quoting, you know, uh, a, a, a word from Yam, who will be probably speaking sometime later today. Maybe he will speak it again. I just heard him from uh, a few weeks ago that uh, he claimed in a few years, LMs and Gem AI may be out of fashion. There will be something new coming out. So I want to uh, take the liberty to make a guess about uh, what may be those uh, new things toward the end of my lecture. So here is the plan of uh, the remaining time. I'm going to uh, say a few words about uh, some uh, very fundamental theoretical insight in terms of uh, defining loss functions and the training paradigms of large language models. I'm going to skip the algorithm for optimization and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the computing aspect of a large language model because that's something people many often time take for granted. And then I will go beyond LM and uh, say a few words about uh, word models and also, you know, uh, agent models, okay? So these days, you know, um, people are learning all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, language models or foundation models and using all sorts of data, right? And uh, in machine learning, when you start training a model, the first thing you have to decide is to really compose, you know, a training loss and the objective function. And then you plug in the right architecture. In this case now, it's becoming standardized transformer, but it could be in the past, you know, uh, a encoder or a decoder, or maybe sometimes even, you know, a, a probabilistic model, right? So how can we actually design such a loss function? You know, if uh, you, um, uh, were familiar with uh, the classical literature of machine learning, it's been devoted to describing such a zoo of uh, algorithms, you know, and the uh, principles and loss functions. It's actually quite complicated. Uh, whether it is necessary or not, is becoming already debatable. One person may say that uh, it is not necessary because we already have deep learning models. But uh, there may be another way of uh, saying it is not necessary because the ideas may still be resurfaced, but maybe in a more unified and the cleaner fashion. And this actually happened uh, in the uh, science of physics. You know, 200 years ago, we've seen, you know, uh, theories, you know, different theories of uh, very similar phenomena, such as uh, electron magnetism, lights, and so forth. They all, you know, uh, have uh, uh, different names. You know, uh, you know, for example, Ampere's law, Gauss law, Faraday's law, and so forth, right? And then, you know, uh, Maxwell studied systematically all these different laws and extract an uh, insight, which uh, he calls the, the Maxwell equation that describes basically the unification of uh, light and uh, electron magnetism and so on, right? And this, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, movement of uh, unifying seemingly different phenomena and uh, seemingly different, uh, you know, principles, you know, went on in physics even until now, you know, uh, and uh, leading to the discovery of the standard uh, equations, you know, uh, in physics that kind of put, uh, you know, uh, already now five of the four, four of the five natural force, you know, under the same formula, namely the electron force, magnetics, and the uh, weak force and strong force. Gravitational force is probably the next frontier people will see when and whether it can be unified. Now in machine learning, I think uh, there is a, uh, perhaps a uh, benefit to see problems in a similar way, okay? So here is uh, a uh, standard equation that I want to speak a few words in machine learning. Basically, when you train a machine learning model, okay, you can pretty much put, uh, you know, uh, all the learning paradigms and the data set, you know, uh, under an equation that is of this form. So here is your trained model. Let's call it a Q. It's a target distribution. 
it doesn't have to be a description, you know, in uh, Yam's recent work on the energy-based training, this is uh, a unnormalized distribution that, ca that is called a energy function, that's fine. Then you have a target, uh, this is target. This is uh, something like uh, a uh, auxiliary function, almost like a stepping stone for you to kind of, uh, you know, uh, alternate between, you know, a hypothesis and also a target distribution. And then you need to have, uh, you know, another function called the experience function that actually gives you the placeholder of incorporating all types of data, including, you know, uh, data instances, but also interaction experiences, you know, uh, rewards and so on. Right. And your goal of learning is to minimize the divergence between, you know, uh, this auxiliary function and your true target function. And then, of course, you need to make sure that uh, your function is uh, parsimonious. Therefore, the last term is going to define you the level of uncertainty that your model has to kind of uh, uh, experience, you know, before uh, the optimization is obtained. So I claim that this equation can be, you know, uh, used to summarize almost all known learning paradigms that have been used to train machine learning deep learning models. And here I give you a few examples. For example, here you can see the tray of uh, all learning mechanisms, which amounts to plug in different uh, data experiences or different loss functions, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, the equation. And then all of a sudden you can find yourself doing, you know, different types of uh, learning, such as maximum likelihood learning, reinforcement learning, posterior regulation, and so on and so forth. Well, it's a little bit attractive. Let me uh, just show you uh, maybe two or three examples. For example, suppose that uh, I instantiate my experience function to be just uh, a delta function of the data instances, and then plug them back into the standard equation. And after a few derivations, you will see that the loss function becomes this. This is actually the negative variation or lower bound of uh, maximum likelihood training. Okay, so you recover MLE. Or you want to now replace uh, your data experience uh, with, uh, say, uh, augmented data, meaning that uh, you are going to draw data from uh, some training distribution based on their informativeness or their value. So that can be basically parameterized uh, in this fashion. And you plug this back into the standard equation, and you get an equation like this, which is, again, equivalent to the equation under active learning. Or you can uh, now instantiate your experience with uh, what is known as uh, the expected future rewards. Okay, you do something, you know, to the data and to the model, to the environment, and you receive a reward. That's a typical setting under re reinforcement learning, right? So you plug this, you know, into the standard equation, and actually you get, you know, a formula that is identical to what people do in reinforcement learning. Right? So pretty much you can. And in fact, this is one more equation uh, example where you can now replace the divergence function, you know, from uh, cross entropy to a jensen shannon divergence, and then plug in, you know, uh, your your data experiences, and you recover the generative adversarial network models. So the moral of uh, these few examples is that you can pretty much recover most, if not all, the practiced and the hopefully even future to emerge learning paradigms just by, you know, redesigning the formulation of your experience function or the divergence function. And then you are able to do plug and play, you know, for, you know, uh, training, you know, uh, under all type of uh, data and uh, architecture. Right. And that actually simplifies the design of the optimization algorithm. For example, under this standard equation, you can apply, you know, uh, gradient methods, you know, for optimization which actually leads to this uh, very general, you know, algorithm for, uh, for learning, which is uh, in the probabilistic graphic model known as uh, EM algorithm, but in the deep learning community, it is also known as a forward and backward propagation and so on, right? And uh, this algorithm can be, you know, implemented, you know, in a very generic fashion, regardless of uh, the type of models or the type of loss functions that uh, you want to use. So why we, for example, need the different loss functions? You know, from uh, the lecture before, you probably already see that, you know, uh, in training or pre-training large language models, we need to, you know, um, 
find the, define the loss to be a duration reduction loss of a mass data. But uh, in say prompting, you may want to introduce a reward. So there are actually needs for different type of losses, even in playing with the same model. And in this case, we can basically just uh, plug in all these different loss functions into a generic place code, and then use the same optimization algorithm to solve that. Here is uh, a example about how it work. You know, with uh, a pre-trained model, you actually, you know, uh, can define the downstream task, such as fine tuning, you know, or training a add-on model using the embedding or representation learned from the pre-trained model as uh, a auxiliary learning path based on data specific inputs. And then you are going to just plug them into the standard equation and uh, use the same solver to solve it. And this is an explicit example in prompting where you can now in here define your reward functions and data instances, you know, uh, in, you know, into this uh, particular place code, okay? So that's, uh, you know, uh, a very, very quick kind of a uh, summary about, uh, you know, the theoretical underpinning over a big family of, uh, you know, training paradigms people use to work on large language models or other models in the past or to come in the future. Next, I want to say a few words about uh, the compute. So LLM models is very different from uh, our classical machine learning models, which is uh, cute and small that you can kind of play with your own personal computer and then do benchmarking yourself. Your LLMs, you know, really work in the wild, right? So they, they are big and they require, you know, uh, infrastructures that is uh, not probably in your hand. You probably need to, you know, uh, you know deploy and uh, play in the cloud and so forth. So there are issues that is uh, not necessarily, you know, uh, machine learning ish. Okay, there are infrastructure and engineering issues, which actually, you know, could benefit from a lot of machine learning insights. But unfortunately, many of the machine learning researchers uh, do not have the opportunity or maybe the appetite to look into that. So I want to open this problem to you to see how you think. There are issues relating to scale up, scale out, and scale down. And I will say a few words for one of each. Scale up. Well, as we all know, you know, uh, solving any ML training problem is, you know, about running this algorithm, right? You start uh, the weight uh, initiated from somewhere, and then, you know, uh, you are going to incrementally update the weights, right? And the weights are calculated from uh, your training data. And that's basically an algorithm called the gradient descent or ascent. And then depending on, you know, uh, the size of the problem, say your data become really big in this case, so big that your one machine cannot hold it, then you cut it into, you know, uh, different pieces and then put them into different machines. That's called data parallelism. It could also be the case that your model becomes so big. For example, nowadays the model of a LM is uh, a few hundred billion parameters, it's not going to be living in one machine. Then what do you do? You cut the, the parameters and put them into different models, uh, different machines, right? So that basically already explicitly ask you, you know, uh, the problem of how do you actually divide and uh, how to handle communications between different machines. This is, uh, you know, a problem, usually you're just swept under the rug and the letter, you know, a, uh, a solver, you know, from Megatron to, to, to take care of you. But I can tell you that uh, the choice and the configuration of those solvers can greatly impact your performance. So the, the business of uh, parallelization is really about finding the right partition, you know, of uh, your subjects. For example, a matrix, you know, or a sequence of matrix in the computing graph. And then hopefully place them to the computer infrastructure such that you minimize unnecessary communication and also minimize the delay, right? So for example, here I have a computer architecture, which is a GPU cluster. So GPU cluster is uh, actually having a unique kind of uh, 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 heterogeneous, you know, uh, anatomy, okay? On every node, every GPU box, you have multiple GPU cards, which are connected by high bandwidth switches, okay? They are very, very efficient in communicating across different uh, cards inside the box. But then different boxes of the GPU, you know, or different nodes are connected by the ethernet and they are not very efficient. 
imagine that if you are not careful in cutting your matrix, the matrix can be your data, can be your parameters, and uh, they usually are so big that they have to be divided. If you divide them and put them onto different nodes which are connected by the ethernet, you can imagine a lot of uh, waiting time in synchronization communications, right? But on the other hand, on the other hand, if uh, you cut uh, the, the 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 compute and also the data and the model in a way such that uh, you know uh, they maximize the usage of uh, the machine architecture, then you can get a huge saving of the communication. So this is basically the research on automatic parallelization of uh, large computing. And this paper that we published uh, a few years ago was exactly you know, uh, you know, uh, to recognize this problem and define it into a mathematical property problem. You can actually you know, uh, define the mapping of your compute, which is represented in this uh, you know, computational graph, and to the structure of the cluster as uh, a, you know, a alignment problem. And you can actually solve them automatically, uh, optimally using in dynamic programming or integer programming and automatically achieve the best alignment. And if you do the right configuration, you can actually can see a good performance boost, sometimes quite substantial in the order of magnitude across multiple models. Instead of uh, asking you know, a very, very experienced engineer to handcraft a specific parallelization for a specific model and having to redo it whenever you go into a new model. And uh, again, this is a field called system machine learning. It is not only study parallelization. There are many other issues such as uh, deciding how to encode and decode the, the information, the message, and uh, how to pipeline the scheduling and so forth. So the actual computing of uh, large language model training and, uh, and, uh, and fine tuning you know, is actually you know, about uh, finding the best path in this uh, matrix of choices. And that problem, you know, is uh, now, you know, uh, becoming almost like a, uh, you know, a parallel research field next to the language model, you know, uh, study, which actually I think uh, has not been really, you know, uh, as popular and as, uh, uh, as thriving, you know, as uh, the LLM itself. But I think there are a lot of opportunities in here. And also this field will probably continue until after the LLM because other models to be produced in the future will also need to solve the same problem. The next uh, problem uh, is uh, about uh, scale out. Well, that's another practical problem uh, I want to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, nowadays, when you talk about uh, large language models, um, we are still probably in a, a very simple mindset that uh, there is one player that has uh, all the machines and all the data, and I'm going to centralize it and uh, train them in one place. But I think uh, one of the future trends of large language model is to decentralize it. For example, making your iPhone you know, to be not only a data collector, but also a component in the training network to contribute their share of uh, the, you know, uh, the, the aggregated larger models. There are also other domains when using LLM you know, uh, requires a, uh, a uh, extra attention to data privacy, for example, in hospital, uh, it is uh, not uh, so straightforward and not even permitted to share the patient data out of the hospital. But how can you then use those data for training or uh, tuning you know, or prompting large language models? Right? So one paradigm nowadays becoming again popular is uh, called the federated machine learning, where you, know, you are going to you know, assume heterogeneous data and a heterogeneous structure and they join force you know, to train the large language model. There has been some uh, existing work, you know, on, you know, uh, the algorithmic aspect of uh, federated machine learning, such as uh, the federated average, posterior average, you know, which is really about, you know, a two-phase process. You let every agent, you know, to compute their own gradient or their own local distribution and then aggregate and iterate. Uh, the, the accuracy has been not very satisfactory for various reasons. And here, you know, uh, I suggest uh, a new kind of uh, development, which is again to go back to, you know, the fundamental 
principle of uh, how to learn larger scale probabilistic models. Right? There has been a technique known as uh, message passing you know, uh, in the probabilistic inference domain, which basically is built on the concept about learning local updates based on local data and then pass them back to you know, uh, maybe uh, a centralized server and go back and forth. And uh, that actually matched very, very well with uh, the setup and also the configuration of uh, many federated machine learning contexts. But of course, there are mathematical challenges, such as you know, uh, how to uh, reduce the cost of uh, communicating between you know, uh, the server and the clients on you know, the local model and also the global model and uh, how to uh, approximate a complex distribution which uh, can be very, very multimodal with uh, some uh, simple variational approximations, and also you know, how to uh, avoid you know, a state for updates which requires the client to remember you know, all the history you know, of the former uh, earlier properties and so forth. So this particular federated expectation framework tries to offer some approximations you know, to this approach, which uh, I'm not going to have time to go into details, but they involves making very, very you know, uh, intricate choices of the variational family of uh, the adaptive operation algorithms and the statistic clients and state, uh, removing the stateful clients and so forth to achieve the best results. And uh, here is a graph just to show you when a little mass is uh, kind of uh, invested into uh, such a problem, you will see pretty uh, good you know, you know, uh, performance improvement. You know, here, if you are fitting two Gaussian distributions, you know, and uh, using, for example, you know, a, uh, a standard uh, diagonal uh, covariance you know, Gaussian distribution, you know, the federated average and the posterior average will get you, you know, a pretty uh, low quality solution in the here, but uh, the expectation propagation gets you better. Another uh, dimension in federal learning is to uh, uh, give you maybe more flexibility of uh, making use of uh, existing large language models or experts, which is called a mixture of experts. Suppose that you know we've got Jace, an Arabic language model, you know uh, served in UAE, and maybe here uh, your institution creates uh, another version of the Arabic language model here in Morocco. And then, you know, in Paris, we have Mistra and some uh, a good uh, high-quality English or French large language models. Right now, these models are disconnected. Okay, if you want to have a query, you have to make your choice to go to one of the servers and then get your answer. And then you may try each of them, you know, manually. And then, you know, uh, do yourself to integrate if you want, you know, a, uh, a good, uh, you know, answer out of it. But uh, in the mindset of uh, a mixture expert, all these uh, different uh, model instances can be a member or component of one bigger model, right? So this is the spirit of a mixture of experts. It's about assuming and the leveraging on the fact that every you know, uh, model component, in this case, a large language model, is specialized with something. For example, language part specializing in Arab or in French or in English, or maybe skill-wise, I'm uh, good at doing coding some other are doing good at doing mathematics and so forth. And then depending on the problem that you want to you know, query the, the model, there will be an agent automatically you know, uh, sending the question to a agent, but even more interestingly, sending to all agent and then leverage on their complementary skill and uh, get an answer that is uh, aggregating all the answers, not just picking one answer out of it. Right? So how this can be done? Well, this can be done actually by building, you know, uh, a uh, what we call a selection network or switching network that is uh, maybe at the hub. That is uh, uh, knowing how to route your problems into this, uh, you know, maze of uh, networks of uh, experts or pre-trained uh, language models, and then scoring along the way, and then find the best pass, maybe you know, a uh, a shortest pass you know, weighted by the performance score, and then come up with, you know, a combination of the answers back to you. Right? So this is, again, you know, a new idea that has been now, you know, uh, experimented in the community of uh, federated machine learning. And uh, our preliminary results actually 
uh, has been able to show that uh, you know if you are able to get access to different experts and uh, find the way to combine them as I described just now, you are likely to get a, a huge performance boost you know in many of the different domains. Last but not least, uh, the issue about uh, uh, LM sys you know in the wild. Uh, I just want to add a little bit more color to uh, what uh, Kelly said about uh, uh, more efficient fine tuning. Again, you know, it's an important uh, practice, but it's expensive. As mentioned earlier, if you train, if you train or even tune, you know, uh, the full model, you know, you have a very, very demanding uh, memory request because it is as big or even bigger than the size of the original model, right? And we heard about the idea of LoRa which is to really you know, uh, get a low rank update against the pre-trained model and uh, only worry about that low rank component. So in this case, you are able to now you know, uh, you know, uh, reduce the size of uh, the gradient and also the size of the off meta states. But remember, you need to now keep both the low rank parameter and also the original parameter. Therefore, the number of parameters actually increases even though you touch only a subset of that. Right. So that problem is, uh, you know, uh, worth attention. So people went on and uh, come up with uh, another approach that uh, you not only frozen, you know, the, uh, the, the pre-trained parameters, you actually uh, introduce a quantization to reduce basically their memory footprint through, you know, a uh, high uh, low granularity quantization so that you effectively reduce the size of the pre-trained parameters. And then you, you know, uh, you know aggregate them with uh, the, the fine-tuned parameters, right? So in that case, you know, all three counts can decrease. You truly, you, you know, uh, 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 arrive at a saving. In fact, you can play these ideas even more aggressively so that uh, you combine, you know, a LoRa with, uh, you know, quantized matrix factorization. And then you can also, you know, do this uh, mixed configuration not only to uh, you know uh, you know uh, just one layer or all layers of the you know the the, the transformer or the pre-trained model with the same approach, you can actually you know introduce uh, different uh, shades or different uh, extent of uh, the quantization and the low rank approximation depending on where you are in different uh, uh, layers of the network because uh, the different layers of the network carry different amount of information and some you know will uh, lose less even if you quantize it and some uh, may be very very valuable and uh, you know nuanced and they have to be kept as it is and uh, this approach allows you to uh, you know apply that kind of flexibility and last but not least even your loss function can also be made uh, data vacuum you know if you are training a larger model or even fine tune with a very heterogeneous data, you will find that not all data are equally good. Some data, you know, can be very homogeneous and less informative as measured by their feature matrix, information feature matrix, and some are very informative and rich. You can actually augment or regulate your loss function, you know, with uh, a function of the feature information matrix so that uh, you can do adaptive kind of uh, optimization you know, that in a data aware manner. So these are just uh, some of the small ideas that I want to add, you know, to the, uh, the, the practice of a large language model because I feel the model itself may advance into some new forms, but uh, these uh, basic techniques are actually not specifically made only for large language models. And I believe uh, research along this line will continue to hopefully serve future generations models. Now, what are the future generation models? Um, I want to take the, the, the liberty and uh, maybe uh, share with you some of my personal thought about the where LM models is going to go. Let me maybe just uh, present you some fun examples about uh, what uh, the seemingly very powerful LLMs cannot do very well as of now. So that you can see why you know some uh, new developments is really really needed. For example, you know, uh, LM is actually not that necessarily good at doing all types of uh, language-based reasoning. Here is an example. 
So if you can read uh, this sentence, right? It basically says that someone comes into a room and drop a item on the desk. And then after you know, a long text of uh, describing random events, she dropped another item on the desk, and then she dropped another one on the desk. You can try yourself and uh, insert such a, uh, uh, you know, a query to GPT-4 and uh, ask you know, uh, them to answer how many items are left on a table. Very likely, you are going to get a wrong answer. Why is that? Well, it says that somehow GPT-4, which is doing autoregressive learning, isn't very good at doing counting. And why it is not good at doing counting? Because when we do counting, we are not doing autoregressive next work prediction, right? When humans are counting or do many other activities, we actually, in our mental uh, state, we have uh, a, a, a representation of the physical world. You know, when someone drops a phone on the table, it becomes a state of the world that will stick in our brain. We, we quickly capture that, and it wouldn't go away, right? And uh, that's not the case, you know, for a large language model. So obviously, there is a need to uh, introduce some additional ingredients into the model to be able to do, you know, this level of language reasoning. Another example lies in the uh, ability to do embodied reasoning. Embodied reasoning meaning that, uh, you know, uh, when I'm, you know, really functioning as a, you know, a, uh, a creature or as, as a, you know, an agent that need to navigate and walk in the, in the, in the real world, how do I do reason? Right. So that's actually something uh, sometimes ignored, you know, by large language model because large language model assume all knowledge exists in text. But uh, when we do such a thing, uh, we may actually have other ways. So here is another example which uh, tells you, you know, uh, the difference of uh, human embodied reasoning versus uh, language-based uh, autoregressive reasoning. For example, how to uh, uh, solve this uh, block word problem, how to make, you know, uh, from the left configuration to the right configuration. You can, again, scan this graph and uh, send it to GPT-4, okay? Very interestingly, GPT-4 is able to recognize all the blocks and uh, actually came up with uh, a, uh, a plan for you to, to move the blocks. So for those who have a sharp eye, you probably can see something wrong with this plan already, right? So it is trying to move the yellow block, you know, uh, out of, uh, you know, uh, the current configuration and place them on top of the orange one. But uh, not realizing that, uh, you know, there is a red block on top of the yellow ones. Yeah. So why that's happening? I actually don't know exactly why it happened this way, but I can guess that because the goal here, you know, you, you basically, you know, read the graph and uh, autoregressively you see this first and then you're going to regress on top of that and therefore this leads to you the three steps getting to that step, right? Basically, there is a, a one pass solution, you know, to whatever you want to get at. That's basically, you know, what's happening in the uh, large language model. In large language model, mathematically, when you have a query, the query will be tokenized and then turned into some kind of uh, representation into the stack of the deep learning uh, of the transformer until it hits the top of the stack and then pass down, you know, as an inference answer. That's one pass thing. And also all different uh, query will get the same amount of compute. And uh, there isn't a notion of uh, which one difficult, which one is easy and so forth. But uh, when we human being are doing our embodied reasoning, um, there is one thing that is very unique. We actually in our mental state do simulations, okay? Even though it is not necessarily explicit. For example, in this pass, we probably have already very, very quickly and subconsciously coming up with uh, multiple ways of uh, moving that uh, blocks. And uh, then we can compare the simulation and uh, draw conclusions on which one is better. That's at least the one way of doing reasoning, you know, in our brain. I suppose, you know, when we are moving our body, when we are trying to, uh, you know, uh, take on some action, uh, you don't uh, think too much about, uh, you know, uh, you know, complicated things. You just probably very quickly, you know, uh, think the following. You know, there is a there is a hole here. 
if I step, I will fall. Well, if I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Therefore, I do it the other way around. Right? So that's actually a simulation of it. You are doing your mental simulation. And that's not the altruistic reason in this frame proof of field. Thirdly, another question you know, uh, that is already uh, challenging LMs is the so-called uh, social reasoning. Okay? Uh, again, you know, I want to make some fun and uh, invite you to watch this figure from uh, New Yorker. And uh, you can actually, again, scan this figure and uh, present them to a GPT-4. And uh, you are going to get uh, a uh, very interesting answer. So I ask why this is funny, all right? Why this is so funny, right? And here is the answer from uh, GPT-4, right? So basically, it, it kind of uh, see the whole thing already. It sees that, uh, you know, a guy is uh, not able to move forward in writing. And then the Robert you know, is trying to uh, come in and help. And uh, he actually saw that uh, this guy had a few crumbled papers and uh, he is now making the whole stack of paper as uh, a, a pile of crumbled papers. And the conclusion is that, uh, okay, they are equally challenged. Right? So what, what does this mean? It feels, at least uh, w from what I see, that uh, GPT-4 probably didn't really understand what you know, uh, this uh, individual is trying to do. Is he trying to make crumble papers or is he trying to write? Right. And uh, the robot obviously didn't see that, but uh, this uh, uh, GPT-4V didn't uh, see that the robot didn't see what the, the human is trying to do. Right. So that's the kind of a social reasoning which involves a nested reasoning you know, of uh, why I as an agent reason about another agent and the reason about another agent's opinion about another agent. So that kind of... Uh, complicated nested reasoning, again, is uh, not currently achieved inside you know, a word model. So I can go on and on with many, uh, with many examples, but hopefully this pyramid is kind of uh, inspiring you about where I'm heading, right? So human needs is very, very multi-leveled, right? After we are happy with our food and the living and the clothes, we have uh, many ma other more ambitious and complex needs, all the way to self actuation and uh, transcendence, right? So even not talking about that far, for example, you know, uh, say uh, cognitive needs is something that requires uh, way more than just uh, reading and understanding text and image. And likewise, the AI agent also could uh, benefit from, uh, you know, a uh, clearly defined pyramid of uh, different functions and the empowerments. So here is uh, an attempt to enlist all these uh, different uh, needs and the functions in the level of uh, difficulties. And you can actually see why I stratify them you know, uh, in this way and uh, call them with different difficulties. For example, here you can see from the, 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 the right panel, you know, the capabilities enabled from this you know, uh, function. And you can probably sense that they represent you know, an ever-growing degree of uh, difficulties at many levels, at many, uh, uh, at many uh, you know, uh, meaning. And it's actually helpful to position where we are and uh, what's next. For example, if uh, the capability of an AI agent can be divided in this way, you probably can realize that the GPT-4, okay, as of now, is probably able to cover the bottom two layers, read and the write, and the watch, see, and also pr produce and, and generate images, and the listen and also speak. It's very, very complete already, but not more than that. Because uh, the next level, when it comes to you know, logic and reasoning, you already saw the example where GPT or LMs are crumbling. Right, at least uh, fail in some cases. And that's where I think the next uh, wave of uh, new models and architecture will be needed. And this is called the word model. I will say a few words about the word model before I close. Of course, you know, if you want to go up there, I, I don't know what's, what that is. It could be a crystal ball. So, so what is reasoning? Right? Reasoning is a very, very complex kind of uh, you know, uh, function. And I want to make it simple. For example, in the example in here, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, we need to basically, you know, be able to predict the next state. When I drop a phone, 
what is the next stage? The next stage is basically a table with a phone. And then I put uh, a orange there, the next stage will be the table with a, at, uh, with a phone and also an orange. That kind of uh, ability should be in your model, right? And then, of course, uh, you can add to that the sequence of movements. You know, if I do something, I take away, you know, a phone or I put something else, you know, I should be able to translate that into my word state. And then after that, you have more complicated logistics and tactics, which are multi-step actions on top of that. So are we already having that now? That's a problem. Many people believe, you know, uh, the current GPT model, and maybe with the recent uh, publication of the Sora, which is an image simulator or image generator, we may already have that kind of a next state prediction. After all, this, uh, you know, Momos is walking, therefore, he probably knows uh, the next state because it is a time series of uh, images, right? So I want to argue that generating text and a video and a image isn't equivalent to understanding. So that's actually a very, very key thing because uh, it is debatable. I don't know where you stand. You know, uh, I recently noticed that uh, many people are debating about this notion about understanding the next word. And I'm gonna show you why it is not equivalent. Maybe uh, without diving into the math, you know, uh, we all, hopefully some of you uh, enjoy music and uh, you probably heard a robot pianist play beautiful notes with no round notes, or maybe even a human being playing very robotically, you know, a piece of music very, very fluently. Right? And oftentimes the music critic would just say that, uh, hey, that individual doesn't understand the music. So, so what does that mean? It really means that production and the generation is very different from understanding, right? So I want to use the same kind of uh, uh, analogy, you know, in interpreting our current foundation models. Because uh, uh, that foundational uh, maybe a deficiency or flaw is going to impact how we're going to design, you know, the next generation model after LMs. Okay, so remember my claim in here, and I'm going to show you uh, evidence, hopefully, you know, uh, solid enough, you know, to uh, prove that. Have you watched this movie before? Right, uh, it's everywhere on YouTube right now. It is uh, one of the clips, you know, produced by Sora, which is uh, a uh, GPT-4 powered or related, you know, uh, video generation models. So let me play that, watch very carefully, and uh, hopefully this time challenge yourself and ask what's going wrong, you know, in this movie, okay? I'm gonna play that. Okay, up to now, did you see anything wrong? Anybody want to shout out? <laughs> What's that? Well, it's slowing, yeah. So the, the production quality has some flaws. It's not uh, so smooth, yeah, that's true. Uh-huh, switching legs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, yeah. What? Okay, yeah. Well, you, you've, you've picked up some of the very important and obvious flaws already. The, 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 the movements, you know, uh, the, the production quality and so forth has a lot of uh, flaws, right? But uh, you look at, I'm pointing out to the question about uh, understanding. Do you see anything wrong with this movie that kind of uh, suggests a poor understanding of what's being generated? I can play that again. You, you can just watch once more and pay attention to the first uh, few seconds. Okay. Okay, start now. Just first 10 seconds. You actually will get the answer already. All right, I think that's enough. For the intro time, I probably need to wrap up. Let me just uh, disclose the answer to you. So, 
if you notice at the first uh, frame of this uh, video, there behind this lady, there is another lady uh, wearing in red. There's another guy behind it, right? And uh, you should notice already that, uh, you know, now I picked it up, right? Now you can see it again. Okay, too early. Watch what happened to that red lady. He disappeared, right? Another guy behind him also disappeared. Well, you can actually you know, watch more carefully later, but that's the message we want to send. Okay. Basically, you know, there isn't necessarily object level or interior level consistency between different frames. There is a seemingly pixel level consistency, you know, across the video, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the generator understands there are people, you know, uh, in this whole thing that I need to track. And there are so many people I need to track, which one to track? If you understand, for example, the very mechanism behind the image generation models, you probably wouldn't be surprised why that's happened. Because uh, either VE, you know, or GAN, or diffusion model, actually has no notion of uh, concepts and objects, okay? It's basically a distribution of pixels. And then generating image is about drawing, you know, from the distribution of pixels, another pile of pixels, okay? You cannot actually easily manipulate the video by stopping in the, in the middle of the way and say, hey, I want to park a car in front of the building, or I want to park a car behind the building so that uh, five minutes later, when you turn around and behind the building, you will see a car. There is no trust function, okay, in any of the current uh, video generation kind of uh, softwares. Okay, long story short, that's actually, you know, uh, where we are pointing to. You want to basically, you know, have uh, a word model that is uh, giving rise to the next word state, conditioning on actions. This word could be a physical word, could be, you know, an embodied experience, social word, and the emotional word, and so on. And only when that is available, you probably can start thinking about reasoning, because uh, your reasoning, you know, needs to simulate. And uh, you cannot simulate to write if you don't even know, you know, at the concept and object level, you know, what the word is. Okay, so pixel level memory very often time isn't helpful, you know, in this case, or at least uh, it is too expensive for you to keep track of all the pixels. Okay, okay so uh, let's wrap up what a ideal word model should look like. Well, it should uh, really have, uh, as uh, Michele just mentioned, the next is to multimodal. There are many, many reasoning that has to happen outside of text. You know, it is a very, very difficult for you to reason, you know, uh, this word in text, writing everything down and then do the next uh, prediction. People can do it a lot better, you know, just directly using images, okay? And there are also something like this, which is impossible to do it in text, right? You pour water into a glass and that's basically having something to do with the real world physics, how the water is moving and when they bump into a glass and so forth. You cannot write an equation or use a, a, a paragraph text to describe that movement, right? But, you know, with a simulation and uh, with a human intuition, we actually know how to do that, right? So that basically points you the need of uh, integrating time series data, multimodal data in image and video and audio and other modality to build uh, a model that is larger than the large language model itself and maybe even using additional architectures to capture additional information. And secondly, you need to have uh, the multi-experience learning. You have to learn through interacting the world. For example, here there's a book of uh, rock climbing. No one learns rock, rock, rock climbing just by reading a book. You have to climb yourself. Right? And uh, lastly, you need to also have uh, the right architecture to capture that information. For example, you know, uh, you can, for example, right now follow the LM and uh, do reasoning directly in the space of words. And I just said that uh, it is not very convenient when you are dealing with physical words in some cases. And uh, the SORA is doing the reasoning in a pixel word. And I just said, you know, you'll see the example. It is also not necessarily working because uh, the pixel continuity or discontinuity may be misaligned with the object level and concept level continuities, right? So one approach 
which goes back to our classical literature of uh, LSM M and the HMM, is to introduce the latent states, which is uh, a higher level summary you know, of the concepts, giving rise to what you observed. Right? And right now, there has been a number of attempts to introduce latent states into the current diffusion model and the language language model to make them into word models. And here, I just gave you an example. Right? So here is a recent work that we did in our group, which, uh, you know, just to uh, try expand, you know, from this uh, whole history of uh, image generators, starting from autoregression models to GAN model, VE model, diffusion model, and so forth, to really, you know, uh, you know, overcome, you know, their deficiency and uh, introduce uh, some new architecture, which is a sequence of uh, latent state space. Okay, that can be explicitly inferred and also, you know, uh, aligned with the uh, human level concepts. And uh, a result of that in results in a model that is a lot more diverse and, uh, and accurate and also efficient and correct. Right? So this is a comparison of uh, this particular new architecture to all the existing architectures that uh, you see before. And also you can tie together such a model, you know, uh, in tandem to allow temporal evolution and the inferences so that uh, you actually can really uh, manipulate and uh, steer the model to do certain things, okay? Which sounds like trivial, but it's not happening. You know, it's not uh, allowing you right now to, you know, cut yourself in the middle of a uh, flow of video and uh, inject a new idea or a new object and change video. That's not allowed right now because there is no kind of placeholder and no architecture to carry that idea. But uh, this model allows that. Just to give you a few example, for example, you can see the previous picture and the next picture and uh, you know aug augmented by a particular action you know in that I want to move the lever to the right of the block I want to take out a iPhone from the pocket raise your head to some degrees uh, put a glass on somebody's face and uh, you can actually try you enter an image and you ask this motion right now it is not very trivial to generate the next picture exactly as uh, an add-on of the sentence. They will probably redo an image for you, which is different from the previous one and causing inconsistency and so forth. And the reason is because there isn't a hidden level concept, okay, that represents all the contents. Okay, so this is the word model. Are we done with the word model? I know I'm done almost uh, running out of time, but uh, let me take uh, three more minutes to show you a movie to really maybe even further stimulate or irritate you about uh, the, 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 the urgent needs for new innovations. So look at uh, this video, which was uh, produced uh, in uh, almost like uh, 19 years ago by the psychologists. What did you see from this video? Did you see squares? A square, a triangle, and a ball, right? And also a box, that's what you'll see. Yeah, that's also what GPT would see. They will see all these objects. And then what did you see? Uh-huh. They are moving all over the place, right? So the, the, the actions are seen. Did you see something else? <laughs> Okay, right, yeah, yeah, please. Yes, yes, you are all right. So we human being, you know, have this uh, very, very unique nature called empathy, right? We actually could uh, read, you know, a, uh, a human touch out of uh, even these uh, very, very boring, you know, uh, shapes, right? And that's basically we are an agent. We are not just, uh, you know, uh, a reader, you know, or a photocopier or a camera. Right? So that's basically the need for an agent model. 
because right now, you know, all the machine learning agents are built to be a very, very good photo reader, a very, very good uh, memorizer, a very, very good, uh, you know, camera and so forth, or maybe a, a facial recognizer, but uh, they are not yet at uh, distilling, you know, those uh, other important qualities, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, subjects, I would say, not even human, right? For example, strengths. And uh, you probably already read the strengths a lot of it, right? There are stronger shapes and the weaker ones, goals. Relationships, even moral judgments, and uh, even beliefs and so forth, right? So from such a very, very simple movie, you know, uh, many people, you know, maybe all people can read uh, a whole lot of uh, depths and the interesting stories all of it. You know, you kind of already impersonate all these uh, sh shapes already, right? So that's basically what's needed next. Because uh, when we want to, you know, build uh, a robotic agent to function in real world and uh, collaborating with us or go with their own task, they have to understand human intention and the human world. And that's basically the next frontier of, uh, you know, uh, word model and large language model financial models, which is called the, the, the agent model. You need to basically now carry out something with a goal, and the goal could be, you know, a very, very uh, complex and uh, multi-leveled, and also with a belief so that uh, you actually can compare, you know, uh, what you see with what you believe and plan accordingly, right? And all this actually are still in its infancy. So I think that this uh, whole business of a uh, large language model or function model basically has just started. It's uh, not uh, as uh, many are claiming that we are reaching AGI you know, in two or three years and then very little is left for human being. That's not true, okay? This whole thing actually needs to be done and also doesn't have to be done with big machines. It actually can happen, you know, in the academic organization. And that's why, you know, uh, you know, uh, I've been collaborating with many researchers, you know, small groups study both theoretically and also, you know, uh, practically many of these uh, different implementations and ideas. So with that, I want to conclude, right? So yeah, we see GPT is beating human, you know, in many, many of the texts and also tasks, but there is still a long way to go to achieve human level intelligence and the functions. And, uh, I think uh, you know, the evolution of uh, the large language model or the current uh, you know, uh, generative AI uh, may you know, uh, bring in you know, a lot of uh, new level of empowerment. People are talking about uh, the revelation and the enlightenment due to the printing press which uh, make available the books to people. And here I think uh, GPTs is literally in a larger version of the printing press. It is making the knowledgeable, the entire universe of knowledge at your fingertips. But that still doesn't mean that you have nothing left to do. You can actually be empowered by those tools and uh, find you know, uh, greater things and more interesting projects to work on. So with that, I want to conclude and thank you for your patience.